Hey, this is Lance from Langchain. There's a lot of interest right now in frameworks for building AI agents. And Langgraph is one. And a lot of people ask, well, what are the benefits of using Langgraph as a framework? And I want to tell you in very simple terms what the benefits are quickly here. You get persistence, you get streaming, you get debugging and deployment. Now, persistence breaks out into a few different things. Short-term memory, long-term memory, human in the loop. Streaming means streaming of both tokens from different LLM calls or state of your assistant, agent, whatever you're building. Debugging and deployment involve Studio, a very nice environment for visualizing your assistant or agent during its execution. And a lot of support for deploying that very quickly with things like observability and Langsmith. So that's kind of the case for Langgraph. Now, the question is, when I use a framework, what is the overhead? You know, what's the cost? I can see the benefits. What are the costs? And the costs typically are you have to learn some API, okay? Now, in the case of Langgraph, you have to learn a few specific things. You have to learn about what is state. You have to think about laying out your control flow or your assistant as a set of edges and nodes. And you have to compile it as a state graph. So really the motivation for the functional API is to say, can I get the benefits of the Langgraph framework without some of the overhead? Like what if I don't want to specify state and relay this out as control flow of edges and nodes? I just want to write Python code as I already had, but just do some little things to turn it into a, a Langgraph application and get those benefits with really minimal code changes relative to what I would do independently. So I want to kind of motivate this. I'm going to build an agent kind of from scratch without Langgraph at all. So I'm gonna refresh Notepad right now, and I'm gonna go ahead and define a few tools for my agent. I'll use Anthropic, and I'm just gonna use this convenience tool decorator. So this is the Langchain integration for Anthropic and Langchain's tool decorator, which I'm just gonna to use to decorate these raw functions, multiply, add, divide. And you'll see why it's useful later. That basically in implements a particular tool calling interface for those functions, which makes it easy for me to call them. Add the tools as a list. I bind them to my LLM. And here's a set of a few simple functions I can use to define a tool calling agent. First, call my LLM. In this case, I call that LLM with bound tools. I basically tell your helpful assistant, task web forming arithmetic. I also have a function that will call whatever tool based upon the LLM's decision as to what tool it wants to call. And I have this agent function, which will call the LLM and we'll continue calling the LLM until it does not make a tool call. And so what's gonna happen is, I'm gonna pass an input, it will call the LLM, it will check if that is a tool call. If it's not, you end. If it is, you execute it. You take the output of the tool call, you add it to messages, you pass that back to the LLM, and you continue until no tool call is made. So let's have a look at this. I'm gonna pass in add three plus four, and you can see very nicely, here's the progression of messages. We pass this in as a human message. The model then decides to make a tool call. Look at that. We can see the tool calls made. This tool message is returned back from call tool. You can see we respond with the tool message. So that's great. And the model receives that and responds directly with the output. And we end. Sybil vanilla agent, no land graph. So now let's bring in Langgraph to get us one particular thing. We're gonna use Langgraph to get a persistence layer. And this is gonna allow us to save our conversation with the agent. So it's basically giving us what we call short-term memory. Now there's really two things to understand about using the new functional API with Langgraph to set up your agent workflow or chatbot really easily. One is entry point. This is a decorator that indicates the start of whatever you're building. It produces a Pregel object and abstraction for managing a few things for you. It manages execution. So it gives you a standard interface for synchronous, asynchronous, or streaming execution. And it also manages state for you. In particular, checkpointing, as we're going to see shortly, and human loop, which we'll see in a little bit. Now, the other decorator to be aware of is task. This just ensures that any functions that are called by the entry point function are saved as checkpoints. This is especially important for caching results. For example, if you've run like a time-consuming operation, it's cached for you, but it also allows you to stream updates from those tasks and also enables tracing for those tasks. So let's just make this concrete and show this with our existing agent code. So here's the code we are working with, and I just flag new and anything new I've added. You can see I just do a few imports, import the decorators, 
And I'm also going to import this in memory check pointer for line graph. And you're going to see just above the functions we had previously add this new decorator task. These are registering the tasks to our agent. I define a check pointer. This is what we're going to use to save every checkpoint or step that the agent takes to what we call a thread. And we inject that check pointer in with this entry point decorator. Now what's cool is now we have this defined, we can use previous to access prior checkpoints. We can grab them here. Now this all looks very similar to before. The only difference is you see we call this result when we perform these calls to our functions, which are now registered as task. And this is because tasks now return a future object, which is just a placeholder for result that will be available later. And if we add result, that tells the code that we actually want to wait for the result of that task. Now in LangGraph, checkpoints from our agent are written to what we call a thread. And the checkpointer that we injected into the entry point will basically write to that thread. So we can define a thread ID. We pass it as a configuration to our agent. Now our agent now is a LangGraph agent and it has an interface of common methods, including invoke, stream, batch. We'll call invoke, we'll pass in the input and our configuration, and we'll run it just like before. Great, so looks similar to what we already had. That's great. But what's nice is because we now have a checkpointer, we actually can go back and look at the last checkpoint written, which will have the full list of messages in our agent. So you can see we call this agent.getState, passing the configuration, and there we go. So now these are all saved to our thread, which are accessible to us in follow-up discussion with our agent. So we can pass in the configuration, which has our thread ID, and we can say take the result and multiply it by two, for example. Now, if you didn't have persistence or short-term memory, it wouldn't know what that result is. But because we can pass in this message history via the configuration, which has our thread ID, this will just work. There we go. So we see here's that full prior set of checkpoints that we had. And you can see it takes the prior result and which was seven multiplies it by two and we get 14 the correct answer so very simple example of how just a few decorators now give us persistence which allows us to retain long-running conversations with our agent and what's nice is those conversations can have interruptions as we just saw but also it gives us a lot more capabilities in terms of human in the loop which we're going to see next so now that's a very good segue. Let's introduce human in the loop. And I want to show you something interesting from a nice blog post that Anthropic recently put out on building effective agents. So in this section about describing agents, they mention specifically agents can pause for human feedback at checkpoints. That's exactly what we were just talking about. Or when encountering blockers, it can then terminate upon completion. So human loop is a very useful way to do things like approval for certain tool calls or to check an agent's work during execution. So for human loop, we only need to introduce one new thing, which is this interrupt. What we're going to do is we're going to inject this in our tool call, okay? And what we're going to do is we're going to stop before the agent actually invokes the tool and check to confirm that we want to actually call the tool. Now, this is useful if it's, for example, a tool that can be a little bit more sensitive, for example, right into a database. So all I need to use is interrupt function in LangGraph which allows you to specify information you want to show to the user. So in this particular case, it's a dict. So you can just define a dict that you want to show. In this case, we're going to show the user the tool call, as you would expect, and also give the user a call to action. Please approve or reject it. Now what the user passes back will be sent to is approved, and we can use that in downstream code to do different things. It could be feedback the way you actually want to interject into a, into a function call or into an LM call. It could be an approval, Boolean, for example, true, false, just like we see here. In this case, if true, then we go ahead and make the tool call. Otherwise, we'll say tool call rejected. And so we'll run that before. We'll create a new thread ID. We'll pass that to our agent right here. And we'll go ahead and stream everything up into the interrupt. So I had a little bit of logging that we can actually see what's going on here. So we're executing our agent and we call the LLM. The LLM looks at our input and decides to call a tool. And then we enter that tool calling function. And this is the interrupt that we pass to the user via that interrupt function. We can see, we can look at the tool call and we can look at the action. Please approve or reject it. Now to do that, all we need to use is command from LangGraph types. And we can just pass in command resume true. And this will go ahead and be passed to 
is approved right here. So that true will be passed through and the control flow will proceed accordingly. Run that and there we go, perfect. Now I do wanna show something kind of interesting here. We added, we kept our logging. So you can see after interrupt, you still start at the entry point. You can see we still have this executing agent logging, but let me see, let me show you something pretty interesting. Notice how we don't call the LLM first again, because that's a task and that output has been cached for us. So what happens is we go ahead and pass over any tasks or steps that have already been cached up until we hit the task that had the interrupt. In this case, the interrupt was in tool calling. So that re-executes, it injects what we passed right here into is approved and then the agent proceeds and it calls LLM to complete and provide a response with the output of the tool call. The tool call itself executes using these arguments, three and four, and then returns seven to the LLM, which results in our final answer right here. And so to kind of recap what happens here in the initial execution, call the LLM, the tool call itself is cached. Then we go to call tool. It starts, but it's the interrupt. We wait for the human input. Then we resume, call tool continues from the interrupt point. The initial result from call on had been cached. So that doesn't run again, just as we saw in the logging right here. So again, it started with calling tool. That's great. Tool calls executed. And then we do a final call LM to take the results of the tool call and give us the final answer as you see right here. So it's a nice little illustration of caching when you're using tasks. Now, another powerful thing you can do once you have this persistence layer is what we call time travel. So in simple terms, that's basically the ability to rewind in a prior point during your agent's execution and try something different. Let me show you a specific example. So here's our agent, just like we've been working with. Now let's go ahead and run it, just like we've been doing. Again, I have a persistence layer here passed in. Now again, I defined a thread ID and I went ahead and ran my agent, so that's great. Now let's tell the agent to take that result and multiply it by two. And again, we pass in the prior history through the thread and we get the result. Great. Now this get state history allows us to get any prior checkpoint that has been written. It's going to return a list and we can pick any particular checkpoint from that list and get the configuration, notably the checkpoint ID and the thread ID. So this allows us to fork from any checkpoint ID we've written previously. And we can even look at what is in the state at that particular checkpoint. So we can just pass to fork from get state and we can look at it. Cool. So you can see this rewinds us to a checkpoint that has all the messages up to seven. Now we saw above here, we went and said, okay, let's take this and multiply by two to get 14. Now we can try again from the same checkpoint with something new, i.e. we can fork. So let's just say, take the result and multiply it by three. We just pass in again, the checkpoint ID and the thread ID that we want to fork from. There we go. So now we get seven times three is 21. So very simple example of the flexibility you get when you have a persistence layer. And in this case, we do we use it with time travel and we get tracing. So we can look at our agent. We can look at each of those calls. This, for example, is that second run of our agent where we basically took in the history, which was the addition of three plus four to get seven. We then multiplied that by and we got 14 out and you can kind of follow this the whole way through the chain. And there we go. That's the final output we saw. So again, it's very nice to get kind of tracing for free just with a few simple decorators converting your code into a LangGraph agent. Now I do want to showcase another trick that you get with LangGraph. So we saw a few different things. We saw that you can set up a check pointer and that opens up a lot of new things for you. And the check pointer gives you short-term memory. So the agent's steps are saved to the thread and that allows us to pick up from where the agent left off. If we, for example, interrupted the agent in the case of human in the loop, or if we just want to have a long running conversation with interruptions, or if we want to do things like time travel, where we rewind to a prior checkpoint and then try something else from that point in our agent. So this persistence layer gives you a lot of flexibility for operations within a thread. Now, sometimes you want to say things across threads. A good example of this is, sometimes you want to say some information about a user across every thread, which you can think of as a session with that particular user. So imagine I use a particular application. Every time I have a chat with that application, that chat is saved to a thread, but I want some information to live across all my chats, like my name, where I live, and so forth. So LangGraph has a nice abstraction for that, and I'll show you how that works right now. So first, 
let's modify our agent to perform kind of long-term memory writing. So for this, I'm just gonna find a new tool called Upsert Memory, which is gonna take in, you see this new thing, this LangGraph base store. So this is a key value store that's compatible with LangGraph and that can be used to store long-term memories across threads. Here's a case of us upserting information to that base store. So you can see all you need to do is receive store and run this put method, which will take in a namespace for your memories, a key and a value, which is an arbitrary dict that basically came, contains the structure of your memory. And I'll initialize an LLM with that tool. Now this basically looks the same as before. Call LLM, only differences. I now tell it, hey, your assistant tasked with storing memories. Call tools basically the same. Now the only new things are that in this case, I'm gonna initialize this in-memory store. Now this is this in-memory store is just a very simple kind of in-memory implementation of a base store. But we do have a number of others that for example, interact with different databases of your choice. And all I need to do is pass this in again to the entry point along with the memory saver. So to be really clear here, what's happening, you're really passing in two injectable parameters. One is your check pointer. That basically saves the steps of your agent to a given thread, which is great for all the things we just talked about. The second is this store, which allows you to store information across threads. Now you'll see we've extended our definition a little bit where we take in previous messages, for example, saved to the thread and our store. We get prior messages, and we retrieve anything from the store per our namespace right here. So now we do two retrievals, one for messages on the thread, then one for memories inside our store. We format the memories, pass them to our system prompt. Now let's run this just like before. In this case, I'm gonna give it something I want it to remember. Hi, my name is Lance. Cool, just like before, you're gonna see that we interrupted the tool call and this is actually kind of a good example of when you'd wanna use something like an interruption and an approval because we're writing to memory. So we want to approve that, hey, this is a good memory to write. User introduced himself as Lance. Yes, that's correct. Then we go ahead and proceed. We pass in true because we want to go. And there it is. Memory has been updated and we get a nice response. Now what's nice is we can look at our memory store, search it per our namespace and see if the memory is actually there. Good. So we can confirm it's there. Now we can test this by rerunning with a new thread ID. So we're creating a new thread but the store should persist memories across all threads. So it should remember that my name is Lance. I pass in what's my name. So there we go. That's a nice illustration of long-term memory in LangGraph. And just before we have observability through tracing, we can look at, okay, here is our agent. Again, this was after the interrupt. And again, this was after we'd saved memories. And so we can ask, what's my name? Look at the LM call. Let's see how the system prompt actually got formatted. And there we go. So exactly as we expected, the memories are added to the system prompt. And there we have it. User introduced himself as Lance, and that's how it knows, hey, the user's name is Lance. So there you go. Very simple illustration of how long-term memory works in LangGraph. So let's just kind of pull back and do a quick overview here. We start with a vanilla agent implemented in Python. No framework, okay? We then showed how a few decorators get you short-term memory. This buys you the ability to have long running conversations and it gave you tracing out of the box. So it's pretty nice and very few code changes. Now then we showed that having that persistence layer also gives you the ability to do human in the loop. So that is you can actually interrupt and approve things like tool calls or interject feedback directly from a user. We also showed time travel. So persistence layer lets you, for example, rewind to prior checkpoints and fork, try something different. In this particular case, multiply by three rather than by two. And we also showed that LangGraph gives you long-term memory. So this gives you the ability to save things, for example, user information across all threads or sessions with a given user. So what's nice is you get all these benefits with pretty little code addition with this functional API. As you can see, all you need to do is just add a few decorators, notably entry point and task to, for example, the start of your agent or workflow and to any tasks associated and you get all these benefits very easily. So anyway, hopefully the functional API provides a nice easy on-ramp to working with LangGraph that gets you the benefits without much overhead and would love to hear feedback below.